and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church.
and welcome to the House of Praise online service. We're so glad that you are here. We hope that this broadcast will be a meaningful connection to God for you. Do the best you can to remove any and all distractions around you. Hello? <laughs> so you can connect to God. One more thing, please do me a favor and fill out a digital connect card. It's very short and would only take about a minute. This way we know who is watching and it has a place for your prayer requests. It's the best way to stay connected here at the House of Praise. Now, if you're watching on the website, knowperfectpeoplehere.com, there is a link at the top of the browser that says connect card. For Facebook and YouTube, there is a link embedded in the description. There is also a link for you to download today's sermon's notes and a link to give if you would like to do so. Please follow House of Praise on Facebook and subscribe on YouTube to never miss a service. Please follow House of Praise on Facebook. Thank you for filling out your connect card. I hope you enjoy the service.
Hey, buddy, what's going on? Oh, uh, making a pastor appreciation video. You're making a pa Oh, hey, Tommy and Eddie the Skid Guy's here, and it's that time, pastor appreciation. Yeah. Why, I don't, uh, why, why, why the bacon? Oh, why the no, bacon? no, think about this. Yeah? Bacon's the best. There's nothing better than bacon, right? And so bacon reminds me that there's also nothing better than a great pastor, all right? Right? I love that. Okay, well. No, no. It's more. Think about this, like pastors on Sunday morning, sometimes they'll tell a little funny story and they're really hamming it up, you know, hamming it up like bacon. <laughs> yeah. That's really yeah. Also, oh, oh yeah, the bacon bits. Think about this. They're always throwing out these little like spiritual bits, right? That just make life a little tastier, just make a little more savory. Okay. Wow, yeah. you've really thought this through. Totally, totally. Oh, and, and, and they go great with baked potatoes. Who, the pastors or the bacon bits? Yeah. Okay. Well, just as much as we love bacon and who doesn't love bacon, we love our pastors as well. Thank you, pastors, for what you do, how you tend to the flock, how you take care of them, how you shepherd them. We appreciate you so much. So we want to say it all the time, but especially during pastor appreciation, thank you for what you do. Yeah. Also, by the way, if your church is showing you this video, it means they signed you up. <laughs> Get this for... A free year of bacon bits, all you can eat for a year. I don't think that's how it works. No, it's really true. It's a fundraiser my kids are doing. Thank you. We got a new computer lab. Thank you. of praise. I'm Pastor Bill Morgan, and I'm here to talk to you about something very important, your Connect card. Now, if you're watching on the website at noperfectpeoplehere.com, you can go to the upper right-hand corner and click on Connect Card. If you're on the app, you can go to the home page and then Connect Card. And if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, you can go, please, first of all, like and subscribe the House of Praise. And you can go to the link in the description and get to the Connect card that way. Now, when you get to your Connect card, please be sure to tell the House of Praise who you're watching with. Also, at the top of your Connect card is a link to the sermon notes. You can download the sermons and follow along with today's great message. Giving? Thank you for giving to the House of Praise. It has allowed the House of Praise to continue to win souls and make disciples. Thank you for giving faithfully. If you're watching on the website, noperfectpeoplehere.com, you can click the Give button and give safely and securely that way. Or you can text H-O-P-N-Y to 77977. Also, if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, in the description, there'll be a link that'll take you to the giving page. If you really would like to, you can just send, an e send a, a snail mail with a check in it to the House of Praise. And now, another great sermon here at the House of Praise. Hello, House of Praise Worldwide. I'm Pastor Lon, and we're starting a new series today called Satan's Strategies and How to Defeat Them. You know, when I think about this, I think about how every culture has some sort of a representative of evil. But what does the Bible talk about who Satan is? You know, the enemy of our soul. You know, everybody has different ideas, even in Christianity. You know, some people think he looks like this. Just some dark, giant, foreboding, maybe some bat wings. I don't know, but... 
In this series, we're going to talk specifically today about who Satan really is, and then for the next four weeks, we're going to talk about what his strategies are to fight against you and I and how we can defeat him. Amen? Our opening scripture for today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, and it says this, So Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. I think too many of us are not familiar with the schemes of Satan, the strategies of Satan. So that's why I'm doing this series, so that you and I can learn how to defeat him. Come on, let's pray. We're going to ask God's help today. Father, we just thank you for your word. Your word is always true. And so, Lord, no matter what our culture has told us, no matter what different mythologies are out there, even uh, what our traditions have taught us in Christianity, God, we want to know the truth today. Because you said if we would know the truth, the truth would set us free. And so, Lord, today, speak to our hearts about the very real devil and who he is and how we can defeat him. Lord, we know that he has plans to try to destroy us. For you said, Jesus, that the enemy comes to rob, kill, and destroy. But you came to give us life and life more abundantly. Speak to each and every one of our hearts today the things that you would have us to do that we could live a victorious life in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, if you want to download the notes, you go to noperfectpeoplehere.com, and at the top of the browser, there's a button that says Connect Card. Click that Connect Card, and the notes I'm going through today will be downloadable off that Connect Card. Amen? And so as we're talking about Satan's strategies, I, I think we just need to jump right into the first one is simply this, that he says, I'm not real. Satan tries, especially in our nation, to convince everybody that he's not real. He's a myth. He's, he's just uh, something made up to scare us. He's, he's by religious fanatics. You know, there are statistics out there that is, as many as 30% of self-professing Christians don't believe in a literal, true Satan. They, they think, well, he's a symbol. He's an allegory of evil. And so over the next three weeks, we're going to cover a lot of different strategies and things like temptation, lies we believe, pride, but we have to start in this point, even if you believe that Satan is real, we have to start here because he tries to deceive us into who he is. Sometimes we think he's a giant black angel. Sometimes we think that he's this little imp with a red suit on and horns and a pitchfork. Many people don't have a, a, an understanding of Satan and who he is, even if they think he's real. But he's always trying to convince us that he's not involved in our lives, he's not active in this world. And if he can, he'll convince us that he's not real at all. So that's what we're starting with today, that Satan is not real. I'm going to prove to you from Isaiah 14 what the Bible teaches about who Satan is. And so it's, we'll start in verse 12. It says, oh, how you have fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. I'll come back to that in a minute. You have been thrown down to the earth you who destroyed the nations of the world. So in this passage, he's called the shining star or the sun of the morning. It's the word Lucifer. Isaiah is saying Lucifer here, which literally means light bearer. But if you think about what's the morning star, it was actually speaking of Venus and how Venus would rise and reflect the sun. Just think of it in general terms. What's it mean to you and I? It means that he was beautiful. He was brilliant to behold. We'll get into some other passages later on about uh, how he was right in the throne room of God and, and how he shined like a, this beautiful angelic being. He was called the morning star. I think it's funny. You know how I always say that God has a sense of humor? I think it's funny later on Jesus is called the bright morning star. He kind of took that, that title, that description away from Lucifer. But Lucifer means light bearer. He wasn't always evil. He was created perfect. We're going we're gonna to learn about that in a second. And then it says here, for you said to yourself in the next verse, I will ascend to the heavens. I will set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. And, and that word there for mountains of the gods is actually Zephron or Mount Olympus. And there's, there's a lot of speculation if that's what gave rise to Greek mythology. Maybe that was something to do with where Satan landed. I don't know about all that, but what I get out of this passage is he continually pridefully says, I will be like God 
I will ascend to heaven. I will set my throne in the stars. I will, I will, I will, is he was looking to be worshipped. That's really what this is all about is, is Satan is after worship. Why? Because the first rule for the Father is you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not worship any other gods. And so the sin of Satan was he desired to be worshipped. He's saying, I'll be worshipped. And so for the next verses, it goes on. It says, I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. Instead, Isaiah says, you will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to the lowest depth. So really, if you think about what the original sin was, the original sin was that of the pride of Lucifer. Before Adam and Eve were tempted and ate the forbidden fruit, the original sin of mankind or humanity, Lucifer had already sinned in heaven. He had already allowed pride to come into him. He was created perfect, blameless, but his own beauty, his own desires, because he had free will like we have, allowed sin to enter into his heart in heaven. And if you look at these five statements, these five I will statements, I will ascend to heaven. I will set my throne above God's stars. I will preside over the mountains of of the gods. I will climb to the highest heavens, and I will be like the most high. I like to apply it this way. I think about the five wounds of Jesus how he was wounded in both his hands, wounded in both his feet, wounded in his side. And I think it's representative, in my mind at least, to the five statements of Satan, to the five evil. Jesus paid the price for every evil that is ever going to come our way. Satan tries to tempt us with pride. His strategy is to try to get us to worship him. If he he can get us to believe he doesn't exist, he says, I'm not real. If we won't do that, we're going to talk about this down the road. He tries to get us to work for him, sometimes unknowingly. Amen? But see, even that, Jesus paid the price for. He took those five I wills away so that they don't have to influence us. Everything Satan tries to do to us, Jesus has an answer for. That's all I'm trying to say. Sorry if I'm getting in a little bit of deep water here. So let's go on. When when we look at this, Jesus himself said this in Luke 10. He said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. So what does this mean? What I want you to understand and get out of that is Jesus believed Satan was real. He didn't talk about him as an allegory. He said, I saw Satan fall. I saw him fall so fast it was like lightning. Jesus believed Satan was real. So if you get nothing else out of today, understand he is real because even Jesus said Satan was real. And so... People have asked at different times about, well, what happens if, if we don't repent? You're trying to say that God won't let us into heaven? And I'll go to this verse, and I'll say, you have to understand, do you see where Lucifer was instantly expelled, expelled from heaven when pride entered into his heart? You want to know why that is? Because God is holy. Well, what do you mean? What that means is sin can't stand in the presence of a holy God. And so the moment sin comes, it's like, it's like opposite pole magnets. Boom, it's repelled. The way, the way I always say this is it's like, it's like trying to cast a shadow on the sun. See, light expels darkness. So the moment Satan had that evil come into his heart, he was expelled from the presence of God. Amen? One of the things I, I take comfort from there, no matter what you think about Satan and his strategies and Understand this, look how powerless he is compared to our God. How instantly he's expelled like lightning, amen? So in Isaiah 14, you can read that in your own time, he he describes who Lucifer was, who the light bringer was before he was expelled from heaven. And then we're going to look at um, Ezekiel chapter 28. We're going to learn some more about what the Bible says he is or who he is before we get to what he is, and who he is doing things now. So in Ezekiel 28, it it begins talking about the king of Tyre and different things. We're going to come back to that. But in the second half of verse 12, it suddenly shifts to Lucifer again. And says, you were the model of perfection, full of wisdom, exquisite in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Your clothing was adorned with every precious stone. 
all beautifully crafted and set in the finest gold. They were given to you on the day you were created. So what does this mean here? See, again, you know, we, we think of Satan only as dark and evil. And we're, we're going to see later on, he could even come as an angel of light. We see the way he was created, though. He wasn't created evil. He was beautifully crafted. He was the model of perfection. He was full of wisdom. He was exquisite in beauty. And the thing that blows my mind is he was an angel in the Garden of Eden. He was there, probably conversing with Adam and Eve before the whole serpent incident. You go on in verse 14. He says, I ordained you and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. That's the word cherub there, the the guardian angel in the Garden of Eden. You had access to the holy mountain of God. He, He went right into God's presence. And you walked on the stones of fire. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but in other words, he was powerful. He was was there in God's presence. He was the guardian of God's most precious creation, humanity, in the garden. He was blameless, perfect, until the day came that evil was found in him. Amen? So what, what does that mean for us? It means if we have this idea... That, that somehow he's just this dark shadow or that he is uh, an allegory of evil. We're going to miss part of his strategies because he is real and he has demonic spirits that work for him and they want to kill and destroy you, especially if you're a child of God. They want to ruin your life. That's why Jesus said, the thief comes to kill, rob, and destroy. I come to give life and life more abundantly. Because he wanted us to understand the difference between the two kingdoms. But what I want you to understand is Satan is real, and he didn't start out this way. Sin in his heart, evil in his heart, perverted him and changed him. So now he's out to pervert everything that's good, to turn to darkness everything that's light, to destroy our image of who God is, to destroy our image of who God made us. He wants you to be perverted and expelled the same way he was. He wants you to not understand who he is so you'll listen to him instead of God's word, and you'll look at yourself, and you'll think, man, I'm nothing. Nobody loves me. He begins to lie to us. We're going to get into that during this series, the lies we believe that he whispers in our ears. Amen? And we're going to talk about something called renouncing, how to gain freedom from the lies of the enemy. Oh, I'm excited about this series. I really am. And we're, we're just trying to understand who Satan is right now. So if, if you're one of those people that believes he's not real, I'm here to tell you the Bible's very clear. Isaiah felt he was real. Ezekiel felt he was real. They prophesied about who he was in heaven before the fall. Jesus said he was real. And it says this in 1 Peter chapter 5. Stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Can can I put it to you in ways that make sense with our series? His strategy is to come and devour you. So we must learn his strategies. We must stay alert because he's out there. If if you're just walking out the street, think about this, this analogy that they use of roaring lion. If you're walking in the streets of Africa, and you hear a lion roaring in the street, you probably are going to be a little more careful than you normally would be. And see, that's all this is saying. Understand Satan is real. Understand he's coming after you. There's a real battle. There's a kingdom of light. There's a kingdom of darkness. This isn't a game, but we don't need to fear him because he's a defeated foe. And We're going to talk about how much you have authority over him, believe it or not. So stay with us. Stay tuned into this whole series. Amen? And so as as I look at this, it's it's a warning about not falling into temptation. It's a warning about not being ignorant to Satan's devices into just saying, you know, we have a real enemy who's out to kill us. It's a warning. And whenever we get a warning from Scripture, we have to pay attention. And so that's what we're doing today. We're trying to learn his strategies so that we can stay alert to what he's doing. Amen? 
2 Corinthians 11.14 says this, but I am not surprised even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. What does that mean? It means Satan doesn't come like this. This Halloween costume, this huge sword, the dark wings, sometimes the skull face, all these things we see. And I'm not saying celebrate Halloween. We don't celebrate Halloween. But what I am saying is we have this idea that our culture is given to us as to who Satan is. But Satan can come as an angel of light. And, and the Apostle Paul, as he's writing here, uh, he's, he's saying, look, I'm not surprised if people aren't what they seem because even the devil doesn't come and show you he's the devil. He disguises himself as an angel of light. He's not going to show up with a, little, with a pitchfork and, and some horns and say, come serve me. He, he comes and says, hey, have you ever thought about this? He begins to, as we're going to learn some other things, question God's word. He begins to tempt you. God won't care if you do this. He begins to whisper. He is sneaky. I think it's, it's appropriate that he came in the form of a snake, that he slithers in the garden, that he's sneaky, right? And so the apostles here are saying, I'm not, I'm not surprised that sometimes people are deceptive because Satan is the father of all deception. He, he can come as an angel of light. So why is this important to us today? Because I think as Christians, we have to be aware of his devices. We can't be ignorant of his devices. He disguises evil as good. You know, one of the prophecies in the scriptures is in the end days, they'll call evil good and good evil. I see us calling things that the Bible says are evil good today. And when we stand up for righteousness and try to get people to do what the Bible says, we're called evil. Evil is disguising itself as light. Evil is disguising itself as good. That's what Satan does. So he's going to be sneaky. He's not going to come to you openly and boldly. He's going to come and try to deceive you. That's his strategy. So what, what does it mean for you and I? It means this. Satan operates in people. He, he's not going to come slithering up to you in a snake. He's not going to be a winged bat. He's not going to be a, a horse rider in a hood with a skull face. He's going to come in the form of a person. He's going to talk to you through people. He's not omnipresent, meaning he's not everywhere at once. He's not omnipotent, meaning all-knowing. He's not like God. God is everywhere at once. God is all-knowing. Satan is a finite, created being. He was an angel who was cast out. He can't be everywhere at once. He, he has to be in one spot at a time. He has one place at a time, and he works through people most of the time. He's not even coming to you himself. You know, I used to think that Satan was in my mother-in-law, but I now think that that's probably unlikely because I know it's a bad joke. I can make it because Pastor Joanne's not here right now. He works through people. He, he will get people influenced by demonic forces. He, you, you think about it, it's, he, he's not going to be all over. He's in one place. So if you say, I saw Satan, you, you didn't. He's in one place at a time. Like, for example, in John 13, 27, it says, when Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered him. He was with Judas. He wasn't everywhere else at that time. This was the most important place for him to be, to try to crucify the Messiah and stop the Son of God. He thought he was winning at the cross. He enters into Judas. And Jesus just tells Judas, hurry up and do what you're going to do. I love that too, because it's a picture to us of how Satan is on a short lease. He, he thinks that he's this roaring lion that goes around killing everybody, but he only can do what God will let him do and what we give him permission to do. We're going to talk about how we give authority to the devil in our lives in the upcoming weeks. I know I keep talking about what we're talking about. I'm excited about this whole series. But I want you to stop for a moment and think about what we've just seen. I know it's a little teacher than I normally, normally am, but when you think about Isaiah 14, he begins talking, Isaiah does in that chapter, about the king of Babylon and all the evil the king of Babylon had done and how the king of Babylon is trying to destroy Israel and had taken all of Israel captive and destroyed Jerusalem and done all these evil things. 
And then when we're reading in Ezekiel 28, it's talking about the king of Tyre, who again was evil, child sacrifice, a whole bunch of things, and fought against God's people and was into Baal worship. And so there's these two actual historical beings, king of Babylon and the king of Tyre, and then both of them are tied to Lucifer. Could it possibly be that the reason the prophets wrote it that way was that these were men who were actually influenced by Lucifer himself at the time? It's very interesting to me. Because we know that when it talks about the king of Tyre in, in Ezekiel 28, that he wasn't in the Garden of Eden. He wasn't an anointed cherub, an anointed guardian angel. And so, therefore, it's talking about Lucifer. But in the beginning, it's talking about historical things that the king of Tyre did. I think this is the way the Lord is teaching us that Satan works through people, that he's not all-powerful. He's not everywhere at once. He can only be at one place at a time. Now, he's got a lot of little demons running around for him, but I'm, I'm just saying Satan isn't everything some people think he is. We don't have a need to fear him. We, we don't play around with him. We don't trifle with him, but we don't need to fear him. We're going to talk about how to conquer him. So, you know, we, we, we see how he entered into Judas, and we're like, yeah, yeah, Judas betrayed Jesus. We get it. But I want to show you a really weird scripture. In, in Matthew 16, Jesus begins by telling everybody, this is the plan. I'm going to go to the cross. This is my prediction. I'm going to lay my life down for you, basically, he was saying. And Peter had just said to him right before this, who do men say I am, Jesus said. Peter had said to him, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, flesh and blood have not told you this, Peter, but my Father, which is in heaven. In other words, God just spoke through you. The Holy Spirit just spoke to you. Then, right after that, he says, I'm going to go to the cross. And Peter says, don't go. Peter's like, God forbid that you should go die for us, which is the whole reason Jesus came. But this is where it gets really weird. In verse 23, Jesus turns to Peter and he says, get away from me. What? Satan. He doesn't say, get away from me, Peter. He says, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things from a human point of view, not God's. So am I saying Peter was possessed by Satan like Judas was? No. What, what I'm saying is this. Even followers of Jesus can be influenced by the devil. We can have the devil whisper in our ear. And that's, we're going to spend a whole week on that in two weeks on, on how the devil influences God's children and how to break free of that influence. Amen? And so understand that you're in a real battle. If the apostle Peter can have a revelation from God as to who the Messiah is and the next moment believe a lie from the devil, we certainly must understand that Satan has a strategy to deceive us. So the first thing is that he's not real, so that we'll ignore him, or that he is not running around like a roaring lion. The second strategy is this. He questions God's word. Every time you see Satan show up, he questions God's word. You know, so Peter says, no, don't go to the cross. The first time we see him interact with human beings is in Genesis chapter 3. The serpent was the, shrew the shrewdest of all wild animals that the Lord had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say, whoa, whoa, whoa. If you're taking notes, underline that or highlight that. Did God really say, can't you hear the serpent? Did God say, you must not eat of the fruit of any of the trees in this garden? And, you know, we know there's a whole other sermon there about how Eve said, no, we shouldn't eat of that tree or even touch it, blah, blah, blah. But I want to I want to clarify something right here. There's a debate going on right now as to whether it was an actual serpent that Satan possessed, or if this was a name given to him, like oh that old snake Satan. Like you might say, oh that 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 so and so he's a dog, or that so and so he's a snake. Either way, it doesn't matter if it was a literal talking serpent, or it was a allegory given to talk about how deceptive the cherub, the angel who was in the garden talking to Eve was. I kind of like that second one because it would make sense to me because all this time I've been like, why would Eve talk to a snake? But 
Lucifer was a snake. So whether it was a talking serpent or it was Lucifer being serpent-like, either way, what did he do? He said, did God say? Did God say? He does the same thing today. Did God really tell you to go to that church? Did God really tell you to marry that person? Did God really tell you that he was going to heal you? Did God say? In this word, is the Bible really true? You know it was written by the hands of human beings, right? There's always this questioning. And so Satan comes in verse 4. He says this, you won't die. So there's a lie. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. Well, maybe it's a half truth because he said, you won't die. Well, they didn't die immediately, but they still died where before they had immortality in the garden. But he said a whole truth after this. God knows your eyes will be open when you eat it. You'll be like God knowing good and evil. What does that mean? He's, he's taking truth and he's twisting it to deceive us. That's his strategy. He's questioning God's word. Did God say? She's like, yeah, this is what God said. He's like, well, that's not really what it means. You'll be like God, which is true. But he was tempting her to sin. We're going to talk about temptation a little more next week and how to overcome it. But at that moment, they did understand the difference between good and evil. So not everything Satan says is a lie. And so when people will say to me, well, you know, I'm going to go to a psychic or, I, you know, the, my astrology was right. I, I say to them, listen, the measure of whether something's good or evil is not its accuracy. It is its origin. The origin of that truth that you'll be like God, knowing good from evil, was from the mouth of a snake called Lucifer. And so therefore, it was evil in intent and in purpose, even though it was accurate. Amen? So we need to understand Satan's strategy. He's going to question God's word. He's going to twist God's word. The devil can quote scripture he did to Jesus. But what is the purpose? Is it to draw us closer to God? Is it to get, to get us to love others more? Look at the origin. Look at the purpose of what's being said to you, and you'll understand Satan's strategies. Amen? So we go on, and we look at John chapter 8, and we see a, a, another picture of who Satan is and how his strategy is to question God's word. It says, he, Jesus is talking to some people he's having a problem with, and he says, for you are the children of your father, the devil. Oh, Jesus, tell us what you really think. And you love doing evil things. Come on now, he's just smacking them right between the eyes. I love this. You love do, to do the evil things that he does, your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. He was the first murderer. And he has always hated the truth. There's that deception part coming in. Because there's no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So nowhere in there does it say everything he ever says is a lie. You, you see what he said to Eve was true. You know the difference between good and evil. But it's still for the purpose of deception, because he is the father of all lies and all deceit. He wants to manipulate you to get you away from God and to get you to question God's word. Amen. His entire existence right now comes down to deception, to, to deceiving us. His purpose for existing right now is to destroy our relationship with God because his was destroyed. He hates us because we have what he once had and lost. We have that relationship with God through Christ Jesus. We are able to worship God in spirit and in truth. We, we can be clothed in, in white robes of righteousness because of the blood of Jesus. There is no redemption for the devil. There is no repentance for Satan. And so he hates us because of what we have, what he once had. So Satan's strategies are to first get you to believe that he's not real. And then another strategy is to get you to question God's word. And then he begins to, to use things like temptation, offenses, division, self-righteousness and pride, things that get us under his authority, and we're going to cover all of those through the next three weeks. But before I stop today, I want you to understand we need to defeat Satan's strategies with the Word of God. And one of the most common lies I hear people believe is the lie of self-righteousness. Well, the way Satan would say it to you is this way. His final strategy for today is, you're a good person. Well, 
What are you saying, Pastor? I'm not a good person? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm saying we're not good people. I, I'm saying the Bible says that we're not good. I'll get to that in a second, but I, I know what would happen in my life as a religious person. I would think, well, you know, I'm a good person. And then when I would feel bad, I would say, well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I'm not a murderer, or I'm not an adulterer, or I'm not this, or I'm not that. And we begin to think we're not so bad. But what it says in Romans chapter 3, verse 10 is this, no one is righteous, not even one. Look at somebody in your room say he's talking to you. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. And I'm not trying to add to Scripture, but what that means is no one's seeking God on their own. The Holy Spirit must draw us to repentance. And it's my prayer that the Holy Spirit would draw you to repentance now. So all of us have turned away. All have become useless. No one is doing good, not even a single one. I just think that scripture is, is just as clear as it could possibly be when somebody says, I think I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person. Or I think I'm going to heaven because I go to such and such a church. Or I do some other good work. I volunteer. No one's righteous, not even one. No one's wise. No one's seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good. Not a single one. Yay. Thank you, Pastor Lon. I'm so glad I tuned in. Well, listen, that's the truth of how we're all lost sinners. But the good news of the gospel that Satan won't tell you is that Jesus died to forgive all of our sins. So, you know, we quoted Paul a couple times today in the book of Corinthians. Paul was a murderer. Peter denied Christ, as we saw. Over and over, we see frail, broken, sinful people throughout the Word of God that God redeems their life, and they're there to give us hope. So the lie, the strategy from Satan, is that you're good enough to get to heaven because you're a good person. But the truth of Scripture is no one's good enough. And so the way you get to heaven is by admitting that, by saying, you know what, Lord, I need a Savior. I'm, I'm not good enough. There's nobody good enough. Only you, Jesus, are perfect. If, if we're good enough to get to heaven on our own, then Jesus didn't have to die. He came and lived a sinless life as a human being. Why would God do that? To redeem us as a human being, because no one has lived a sinless life except him. So we're going to pray a prayer right now, and I want to encourage you to say it out loud wherever you are. And this isn't abracadabra. It's not a magic prayer. This is the idea that you're believing in your heart that Christ Jesus is risen from the dead, you're confessing with your mouth, him is Lord, as Romans 10, 9 instructs. So say this, say, dear Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I haven't always obeyed your word. I haven't always followed your ways. I ask you to forgive me, to cleanse me in your precious blood. And I choose right now to live for you and not myself. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer and you meant it from your heart, I truly believe that you're translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And the Bible says that you should tell somebody what you've done. And so I want to encourage you to fill out your digital connect card, noperfectpeoplehere.com. The top of the browser, there's a a link to the connect card, or in social media, it'll be put down there for you to, to click on if you can't find it. Fill out that Connect card, and there's a box on there to check. I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. We're we're seeing several people do this every week, and a couple great things are going to happen. One is we're going to pray for you by name. We pray over those digital Connect cards every week. Two is if you'll give me your contact information, I'm going to send you a free book to help you. I wrote a book called My Next Steps. I'm a follower of Jesus. Now what? And the reason I wrote this book is to help you grow in your faith. And so there's a a 30-day reading plan in the back through the book of John, because people always say, I don't know where to read in the Bible. There there is a guide here on how to pray effectively. There is uh, how to find healthy relationships, serving God by serving others, how to live a meaningful life of worship, how to forgive those that have hurt you. I want to give this to you free of charge as my gift to you to say welcome to God's family. If you'd prefer it in the digital form, you can request that also. Amen. So for all of us, I hope you'll do that if you've accepted Jesus Christ or rededicated today. For all of us, I want to encourage you to attend an online connect group this week. There's five different online connect groups. Go to noperfectpeoplehere.com slash connect, and you'll see them listed right there. 
and they're Zoom groups, so they're interactive. You get, you get to have some of that relationship while still being online. And all of us should examine our lives this week to look for Satan's strategies so we can see how to overcome them. Amen? All right, if you'd like to help defeat Satan's strategies, I really hope this message uh, got you hungry for the rest of the series. But there is a way you can help defeat Satan's strategies right now through the House of Praise Worldwide, through your giving. You can go to noperfectpeoplehere.com slash give. You can set up uh, regular giving through there. That's how I do it. That's how 70% of all the giving comes in. Or if you'd like to, you could text H-O-P-N-Y, House of Praise New York, to 77977 and follow the couple easy steps. I hope this message blessed you, and I hope to see you next week for more Satan strategies. God bless you. Hello again, House of Praise Worldwide. I really hope that you enjoyed that message and it was a blessing to your life. You know, can I just say that speaking of blessing, when we do things God's way, he blesses us. It says in Malachi 3 to bring all the tithes into the storehouse and he'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing we can't contain. I want to encourage you to obey God's word that God would bless you. But more than that, I just want to say thank you to you. When you give, you support the work of House of Praise worldwide so that we can do this broadcast. And you don't understand the impact that your giving has. There's people watching from Africa, from different states around the United States, and we're seeing lives changed because of what's going on right now over these airways that you're watching. House of Praise Worldwide is changing people's lives and impacting people, and you're a part of it every time you give. So thank you for giving. It's very simple and easy. You can go to noperfectpeoplehere.com slash give and follow the three simple steps. It's safe and secure. That's how I do it. Or you can just text to 77977, the word H-O-P-N-Y, and that's another way you can give. Either way, thank you for supporting the House of Praise. God bless you. Hi again. Thank you for attending the House of Praise online broadcast. We hope that you enjoyed the service. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please add it to your Connect card. That way we can pray for you and send you a free book to help you. If you need prayer, add it to your Connect card. And please, Send a link of this service to your friends. And come back next Sunday for another great service. Bye!